Hi, I'm Brooke Dorenzis. I'm the State Policy Analyst at the National Skills Coalition. Thanks for joining our webinar on tools for skills-focused SNAP ENT programs. The Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, which is also called SNAP, has an employment and training program, which is commonly referred to as SNAP ENT. SNAP ENT was created to help participants find jobs that lead to self-sufficiency. Today we have a fantastic panel that's going to talk about how SNAP ENT programs can help participants build skills that lead to family supporting jobs. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to provide a little bit of context on this important topic. So skills are critical to achieving economic security in today's economy, and in fact, middle skill jobs, which require education and training beyond high school but not a four-year degree, make up the largest portion of the labor market in the U.S and in each of the 50 states. Yet it's been estimated that the majority of SNAP households do not include anyone with education beyond high school. So SNAP ENT programs are going to advance self-sufficiency and economic security for participants. It's critical for skill building to be a key component of these programs. Fortunately, SNAP ENT has the potential to create robust programs for low-skilled individuals. States can use multiple funding streams, partnerships with workforce development organizations, and data to help SNAP ENT participants get the skills and supports they need to find stable, family-supporting jobs. With generous support from the W.K. Kellogg Foundation and the Annie E. Casey Foundation, National Skills Coalition has partnered with the Seattle Jobs Initiative to help more states develop and grow skills-focused SNAP ENT programs. And as part of that effort, we've asked today's speakers to discuss tools for creating skills-focused SNAP ENT programs. So we're going to kick it off with Rachel Gregg of the SNAP Office of Employment and Training in USDA's Food and Nutrition Services. She's going to kick it off by discussing how SNAP ENT is part of the Skilled Workforce Solution and how states can use SNAP ENT funding and third-party partnerships to build skill-based programs. Next, we're going to have two presenters who will provide real-world examples of how the tools described by Rachel have been used in states. We're going to have Steve Oval, the Executive Vice President of Governmental Relations at Kirkwood Community College, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and he's going to discuss two complementary state programs that Iowa has used to expand career pathway opportunities for SNAP participants. Then we'll have David Kaz, the Director of Policy and Communications at Seattle Jobs Initiative, explain how Washington State used third-party partnerships to grow its highly successful basic food employment and training program. Finally, we're going to have Rachel Zinn, the Director of Workforce Data Quality Campaign, discuss how data can be used to enhance SNAP ENT efforts. Before that, I do just want to review the National Skills Coalition's mission for those who aren't familiar with us. We organize broad-based coalitions seeking to raise the skills of America's workers across the a range of industries. We advocate for public policies that invest in what's worked as informed by our members' real-world expertise. And we communicate these goals to an American public that's seeking a vision for a strong U.S. economy that allows everyone to be part of its success. So with that, Yuri, are we ready to turn it over to Rachel Gregg? Great, thank you. Rachel, go ahead. Okay, thanks, Brooke. Um, and thanks for, to everybody who's on this call. Um, it's great to see growing interest in this program. Um, I think there's a real window of opportunity right now to do a lot of interesting things with SNAP ENT. Um, and um, you know, I think the growing understanding of the power of the program um, uh, is is great. Uh, and sort of. On that point, I, before I start talking about the details of the program, I really do want to stress the, um, the new attention to this program at USDA and at FNS. Um, we have uh, created a new Office of Employment and Training in the agency um, with six staff in the national office. We are in the process of hiring um, an ENT specialist for each of our regional offices. We have seven regional offices, so we will have a total of 13 uh, staff working on this program in the next few months here, and um, the focus has really been on looking for people who have a strong background in workforce development, um, because the point of this program really is to help people get the skills they need so that they can get a job, get a better job, 
um, increase earnings and move towards economic self-sufficiency. This is about moving people off of SNAP the right way by helping them increase their earnings and do better for themselves and their families. And the agency from the secretary down is really committed to this um, this approach. So, like I said, the opportunity to do something interesting with SNAP and T in your local community and your or in your state um, is very significant right now. So, Yuri, if you want to go to the the first slide. Um, SNAP and T is this um, uh, under underutilized, un um, essentially untapped resource right now. Um, that comes from a population that we just don't do a good job of reaching normally through job training programs, and that's people who are very low income, often very low skilled, and often with very high barriers to employment. And this program is intended to serve that program specifically. Now that we're competing for funds to serve that population, um, as we are in some other programs, but this program is designed and targeted to that, pro to that population specifically. It's a very flexible program, so there's a lot of things that you can do with it, um, including providing not just training, but also the wraparound and supportive services that we know are important to help people succeed in training. And it also allows for post-employment job retention services, which um, for up to 90 days, um, even if somebody has gone off of SNAP. So um, the, the things that you can do with the program are, um, you know, are very customizable and um, uh, and, and there's a wide variety of things you can do. And the biggest uh, problem that we have right now, especially for somebody who you know, has spent the better part of my professional life begging for funds for employment and training programs, is that there are states that are actually leaving money on the table right now. Um, uh, we only have uh, 12 states in FY14 that spent all of their 100% funds, um, and the rest is coming back to uh, USDA. Um, and in some cases is going back to the Treasury. So there are, there are funds available right now for workforce development that are going unspent. Um, and you know, for those of you who've done this work, you know that we can't afford to leave money on the table. If you want to go to the next slide, Yuri. Um, and so for people who are not familiar with the program, there are actually different types of funding under SNAP ENT. And the money that I was just talking about, the money that states are turning back or that not all states are using are what we call 100% funds. And this is the 100% federal funds that FNS gives to states to help administer their program. It's $90 million a year, so it's not a ton of money. It's probably not enough money. It's not probably, it's definitely not enough money to really provide um, high quality training and supportive services to um, all the SNAP recipients who would really benefit from accessing those services. Um, so in addition to the 100% funds, there's something called 50-50 funds, and that's what I'm going to focus on today because that's really where um, I think the greatest potential to expand this program lies. And the 50-50 funds, there's sort of two categories inside of that, um, that funding stream. So there are 50-50 funds that um, can go to the state, and, and I should say 50-50 funds just means that um, for every non-federal dollar that a state spends on SNAP ENT, and by non-federal, that means it can be state, county, city, philanthropic, social venture, really anything that is not a federal dollar and is not being used for a federal match. So your state does not have to specifically set aside um, funds that are earmarked for SNAP ENT. You can look at funds that your state is already spending um, to provide training services, particularly training services that um, SNAP recipients are likely to be receiving. And there's a good chance that um, if, if we can sort of sort through the mechanics and the administration of it, that um, we could potentially be reimbursing 50% uh, of what's already being spent. Um, but there are two categories of those 50-50 funds. Uh, we can reimburse for administrative costs, which um, you know are those kinds of activities that are required to run a SNAP ENT program. And um, it does include uh, tuition, though, in an administrative cost. And then there's other 50-50 funds, which are for participant reimbursements. And these are typically the supportive services that um, SNAP recipients are going to need to persist and complete um, an employment and training program. So it includes things like child care and transportation assistance, but also things like books, tools, uniforms, um, license, license, the cost of licenses, things like that. Anything that is deemed reasonable and necessary for a SNAP recipient to participate in an ENT component. Um, and that is, uh, that is an uncapped 
uh, reimbursement. Go to the next slide, Jerry. So the model that we really see a lot of potential in, so it's not just inside the 50-50 funding stream, but it's what we're calling a third-party partnership, which is a specific way of using 50-50 funds. We go to the next slide, Jerry. So third-party partnership is pretty much just what it sounds like. Um, sometimes it's referred to as a third-party match um, or a third-party reimbursement program. Um, it's actually incorrect to call it a match. Uh, one of the things that uh, people who are interested in this program need to be aware of is that it is a reimbursement, so you actually have to spend the money first, and then we can um, the state would submit the um, uh, submit for reimbursement for what has been spent. So you do have to be able to figure out a way to um, uh, make a commitment to spend the money um, sort of upfront and then get reimbursed for it. But ENT, the way this model works is that ENT services are provided by a third party, like a community college or a community-based organization, um, using their own funds, um, funds that you're that they're likely already spending either through foundation funding or city or county or state funding. Um, and then um, you submit to the state for the services that you have um, are provided, and then get reimbursed 50% through and that get reimbursed get reimbursed back 50% through federal funding. Go to the next slide, Jerry. Um, and here's just some like a, 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 a graphic representation of the sort of the process, right? So the state contracts, uh, and I and I do need to stress that. Um, if this is something, if you're a training provider and this is something that you're interested in, you would have to work with your state um, to try and uh, be written into their state SNAP ENT plan. Uh, the federal, the national FNS, um, our relationship is with is with the regions, and the regions' relationship is with the states. We would not be able to contract directly with a service provider um, to receive SNAP ENT funds. The funds flow through the state, so the state would have to contract with a local employment and education or training provider to provide the ENT services. That provider uses non-federal funds to pay for those services and then submits a claim for reimbursement. FNS reimburses the state 50% for the allowable cost, and then the state passes the reimbursement back to the partner. Um, and this just tracks, like I said, our relationship is really with the state, and then the state, your, uh, as a provider, the relationship would be with the state. Next slide, Jerry. Um, so there are both pros and cons to this third-party reimbursement model. Um, I actually think the benefits outweigh the challenges, and there are a lot of benefits. So you can see it's a way to maximize dollars that are already being spent. It really lets you leverage um, investments that your state or foundations are already making in the services that you might be providing. It allows you to expand the types of services available without creating new costs. So um, uh, under snap and you can um, really do one of two things. You can create new capacity to serve additional people, or you can add additional services. So if you're, for example, you're a training provider, um, and you've got 100 slots available now, but you um, you enter into a SNAP ENT contract, you, let's say, you know, we can, um, you could create, you could serve 120 people next year, so you can create new slots using SNAP ENT funds to serve SNAP recipients, or if you're a training provider and right now all you're doing is providing training, but you also want to provide transportation or child care assistance, you can add those as wraparound services to the services that you're already providing for SNAP recipients using SNAP ENT dollars. So let's you create new capacity and new services if that's something that you're interested in. Um, uh, it can also help organizations um, administer the program. So as I said, it can cover administrative costs. Um, and can cover um, things like uh, case management and career navigation, um, uh, or additional staff capacity if if you if that's part of what you need um, to to cr to create and or run a SNAP ENT program. Um, and in a perfect world, it also starts to align systems. You know, SNAP ENT is one of those unusual programs that um, cuts across uh, programs and systems. So it's a job training program in. Um, nutrition agency, so you know you really can't operate in a vacuum when you do this. The SNAP agency can't or shouldn't at least really um, be trying to do job training, and the job training provider really has to work with the SNAP agency to make sure that the SNAP recipients um, are we're doing everything that we need to to make sure the SNAP recipients are still able to access their nutrition benefits, um, even while they're enrolled in a job training program. So it starts to um, 
get organizations and programs and agencies to talk to each other, um, ideally leading to better alignment across those systems. And of course, the real end goal of SNAP ENT is to try and help SNAP recipients increase their skills so that they can um, get a job or get a better job and increase their earnings and ultimately, ideally, become less dependent on receiving public assistance. Um, so there's really, I, I'm not kidding when I say that this program is just, um, you know, full of uh, currently untapped potential. Um, which is not to say that there aren't challenges as well. So um, in particular, I think there are administrative challenges. You really do have to work closely with your SNAP agency um, to do this. You have to have internal administrative capacity because there's a lot of um, sort of regular and routine um, administrative functions that have to happen. So um, SNAP ENT can only be provided to people who are receiving SNAP benefits. Um, and people on SNAP, as you can imagine, go on and off the program uh, pretty frequently. And so you have to um, make sure that you're regularly verifying SNAP eligibility for participants. You have to anticipate service levels throughout the year. You have to make sure that you're carefully tracking both the non-federal funding sources and what you're spending your funding on to make sure they're allowable expenses. Um, and the financing can be complicated. And uh, it can be difficult for a small CBO because you do have to, like I said earlier, you have to be able to put the money up front and then get reimbursed. Um, and so for smaller CBOs in particular with uh, small budgets, that can be, that can be difficult. You want to go to the next slide, Jerry. Um, the other thing that's really happening, it's happening inside the agency, and I think um, as more states develop these skill-based ENT programs instead of um, some of the older style ENT programs, which were more focused on sort of keeping people busy doing things like um, very light touch job search or something like that, um, it is helping people think differently about this program. So, right, so SNAP ENT should not be a one size fits all program. SNAP recipients come with all different skill levels and lots of different kinds of barriers and need lots of different kinds of services um, and different access to different kinds of training programs. So, if you're thinking about how to design a SNAP ENT program, you really should be um, trying to think about um, what is best for that client. We really do want to encourage client centered training models. Um, you know, and it should not be, you should not be looking at SNAP ENT as a way to just funnel a bunch of people through your program, um, but really trying to look across what's available in your community and figure out what is the best place to place a SNAP recipient so that um, they will succeed um, uh, and again, hopefully eventually uh, become less dependent on SNAP. Um, you know, just like any good training program, you should be looking at individual strengths and weaknesses and the barriers that the clients face. Um, case management and participant supports will be very important for very low skilled, very low income individuals who might be serving through SNAP ENT. Um, and that uh, you really do understand that this program cuts across, you know, multiple multiple needs. Uh, SNAP recipients in some states, uh, SNAP recipients where you have mandatory ENT programs um, for SNAP recipients, uh, if uh, if they don't participate in ENT or if they have problems participating in ENT, there's a risk that they could lose their, their SNAP benefits. So it really is incumbent upon the education and training provider to understand what the requirements for SNAP ENT are in your state and make sure that, um, especially in a mandatory state, that we're not doing anything that could cause a SNAP recipient to lose their benefits um, uh, because we're not providing what they need to um, meet the ENT requirements. So we can go to the next state. Next slide. And I should say, I know I'm going very fast. I'm trying to cover a lot of terrain in um, just a few minutes. And so um, I'm happy to answer questions later on, or if we don't get time to answer questions, um, my contact information is in this, in, in this presentation. And you're welcome to contact me directly if, if I've gone, if I skip something or if you have additional questions. Um, but so you can just see, um, using a snap and third-party model, you can create this kind of righteous uh, system where right, you establish all these partnerships with um, key stakeholders to leverage both expertise and resources, develop a comprehensive array of services so that we're really meeting the needs of SNAP clients so that they can succeed um, both in the employment and training component but also in the labor market, um, conduct consistent and meaningful assessments, and make targeted referrals to address barriers. If there are things that um, SNAP clients are facing that are beyond the ability of you know, your particular training program or a particular training program to provide, um, you should be working with partners in the community to, 
try and make sure that those barriers are getting addressed um, by leveraging other community resources and allowing multiple uh, co-enrollment with multiple partners. And you know, in a perfect world, you get this cycle going where um, it becomes uh, almost uh, self-perpetuating. Next slide, Jerry. And this is the one, this is a conversation that everybody always is most interested in, um, thinking about the funding for 50-50 programs. Again, any non-federal dollar that goes to um, SNAP ENT, which means services that are being provided to SNAP recipients, um, can be reimbursed for 50% as long as it's going to an allowable activity. State, county, or city funds, donations from private firms or nonprofits, foundation funds, social venture funds, um, government entities can, do, can make in-kind donations. Um, you can use uh, CDBG funds. There's a, the way the underlying statute is written allows um, CDBG funds are federal funds, but um, there's a provision in the authorizing language that allows them to be used to, as a match to other federal grant programs. Um, you can use state need grants, worker retraining dollars, opportunity grants, tuition benefits. So you can see there's a lot of places to look, including um, if your state is making investments in things like drug training programs for ex-offenders, um, people who are experiencing homelessness, drug training programs for non-custodial parents. There's a very high likelihood um, that at least some of those individuals, ex-offenders, people who are homeless, people who are non-custodial parents, there's a very high likelihood that they may be eligible for SNAP. Um, uh, and if you can get them enrolled in SNAP or if they're already receiving SNAP, um, you can, um, uh, we might be able to reimburse some of those funds. So um, next slide. My contact information, um, I think it will be available at the end of this presentation again, but I'm happy to answer questions if people have them. Great. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, next, we're going to be hearing from Steve Oval at Kirkwood Community College, and he's going to be discussing how Iowa has put SNAP ENT into place. Steve? Thank you very much, Brooke, and uh, thank you to uh, all of you participating today. I've been asked to share at least uh, one state's experience in how we're trying to adapt several new workforce programs to the SNAP ENT 5050 matching program, and that, that alignment uh, is working very nicely. Uh, the first program I'm going to talk about is the CAP Tuition Assistance Program. Uh, this is a program uh, that you can uh, access uh, through Iowa Code Chapter 260I. It was created in 2011 by the Iowa Legislature, and it really was designed to address uh, much like uh, states across the country are growing shortage of skilled workers with a focus on low-skilled adults. Uh, many states like Iowa that have, uh, are experiencing flat population growth, declining numbers of students coming out of our K-12 system, an aging population, increasing retirements, uh, to a great extent the workforce that's going to drive our state's economy in the years ahead to a great extent already exists in the Iowa workforce. Low-skilled, low-income working adults with little or no post-secondary training or education. And so the Iowa legislature, kind of recognizing that reality, created a series of workforce programs, sort of a portfolio of programs, of which the Gap Tuition Assistance Program is one. This program was first funded in fiscal year 2013. We're now receiving $2 million in an annual appropriation from a new fund that was also set up in that same year called the Iowa Skilled Worker and Job Creation Fund. Um, and as part of that fund, there's about a $40.3 million portfolio of economic development, job training, workforce development programs that are flowing through our state's community colleges to address these needs. Uh, these funds are distributed to Iowa's community colleges on a formula basis to ensure that every region of the state has access to these funds, and the program uh, is delivered by our state's 15 community colleges. Next slide, please, sir. This program was established to provide funding to Iowa community colleges for need-based tuition assistance to individuals for completion of a non-credit short-term skill certificate uh, in in-demand occupations. I think one of the challenges that many of us have had across the country is that for the most part, most uh, state and federal student financial assistance programs historically have only been applicable to credit programs. And so if we have someone in need, uh, many times we're putting folks into a credit program so they can access a federal Pell Grant, for example, knowing full well that what we really need to be doing is putting those individuals into short-term uh, non-credit skill certificate programs that are fully articulated into our uh, more full-body credit programs in order to get them 
on a good start. Uh, this program has an eligibility threshold of 250 percent of the federal poverty level, um, which is higher than what the federal workforce programs are. And in fact, the term gap really came from uh, our identification of a gap between 150 and 250 percent of the poverty level, where we really didn't have uh, federal funding to support those individuals uh, with any kind of tuition assistance or wraparound support, but a great a significant need on the part of tens of thousands of Iowans in that range. Uh, this program allows uh, eligibility for just one certificate program for an eligible participant. Next slide, Yuri. Um, we're able to use these funds to support uh, costs of tuition, any direct training costs, required books and equipment, fees, uh, which include, include industry testing services and, and background check services. I think you'll see those of you that are familiar with the SNAP E&T program would realize that these are all eligible uh, expenses with regard to that program. Next slide, please. The eligible certificate programs, uh, again, as I indicated earlier, are not offered for credit, but they are aligned. Uh, they have to be aligned with a, a certificate, diploma, or degree program uh, that are credit bearing. Uh, they need to offer a state, nationally, or locally recognized certificate or credential, offer preparation for a professional examination or licensure, uh, or provide an endorsement uh, for an existing credential or license, and they must represent recognized skill standards defined by an industrial sector, and I'll talk about uh, industry sector boards uh, in a little bit. Next slide, please. In the past fiscal year, uh, we served uh, just under 3,300 individuals uh, that at least completed an application for this program statewide. Uh, 1,600 uh, were approved and accepted. You'll note that that's about a 50% acceptance rate. Uh, this program was not designed to be uh, an entitlement program. It was designed to have a fairly strenuous eligibility threshold to ensure that participants uh, have a very uh, high degree of, uh, of ability to uh, complete the programs. Um, you can see the numbers of those that completed the training, those failed to complete, and those that were still, at the time of reporting, were still in training or waiting to participate. Uh, we have 191 approved uh, short-term certificate programs across the state. We have a fairly uh, consistent uh, qualification set of parameters in terms of what uh, a certificate program uh, has to look like in order to be qualified for this program. Uh, you can see that our top three uh, programs in the last year were uh, certified nursing assistants, uh, commercial uh, truck driver, CDL Class A licenses, and also welding certificates. Next slide, please. The second program uh, that I want to talk about is uh, our Pathways for Academic Career and Employment program, which I'll just refer to as our PACE program. Uh, it's codified in Iowa Chapter 260H, also created in 2011 by the Iowa Legislature uh, for the same reasons I described earlier. It was first funded in fiscal year 2014, so a year later uh, after we got the initial funding for the GAP Tuition Assistance Program. Uh, it represents a $5 million annual appropriation, uh, again, from the Iowa Skilled Worker and Job Creation Fund, also distributed to our community colleges on a formula basis, and all 15 colleges participate. Next slide. This program was established to provide funding to our community colleges for the development of projects that will lead to gainful in-state employment for members of target populations by providing them with both effective academic and employment training to ensure gainful employment and customized support services. Next slide. Just to kind of run down through some of the characteristics of the program, uh, target populations, uh, those that are deemed uh, to be low skilled, again, uh, a 250% uh, income threshold, individuals that are unemployed, underemployed, or dislocated uh, workers. Uh, eligibility criteria for projects under the PACE program, they need to be designed so that individuals can acquire and demonstrate competency in basic skills, acquire and demonstrate competency in a specified technical field, complete a specified level of post-secondary education, earn a national career readiness certificate, obtain employer validated credentials, and secure gainful employment and high quality local jobs. The program component requirements, uh, you know, a, a full body of, uh, you know, recruitment assessment, referral activities, strong focus on integrating basic skills and work readiness training with occupational skills training, uh, combining customized supportive and case management services with 
other training services to ensure that the participants can overcome barriers to employment. And again, providing training at times, locations uh, that are very, very flexible. Uh, it involves, uh, you know, putting pipeline programs into place, and of course, that's working with our many community-based organization partners uh, who are referring many individuals uh, to this program. Uh, the Career Pathways uh, the program also includes a bridge curriculum development program to ensure that uh, those bridges are in place uh, between our non-credit and credit programs. And I think the two most important aspects of this program is that uh, our, our community colleges may use these monies to employ pathway navigators to assist the students in applying for and in, in enrolling them in eligible pathways for these particular projects. These really are the educational caseworkers, and these are the individuals you know, that Rachel referred to earlier that we need to make sure that there's a strong uh, case management, supporting service uh, connectivity to our community-based partners, many of whom are providing uh, very, very similar services to many of these same individuals. Uh, most of the funds that we're utilizing are helping to support staff across the state. I think statewide we now have probably around 45 individuals full-time staff that are serving as pathway navigators are working directly with the Add to Us and Assistance Program to provide that support. The program also allows uh, the community colleges to use the monies to establish regional industry sector partnerships, which you know, as you're all very aware of, one of the new emphasis uh, in the WIOA legislation. Uh, and we use those partnerships to really help us uh, do a much better job of, of helping to frame the curricular content and making sure that the certificate programs that we're providing are aligned with in-demand occupations in each region of the state. Next slide, please. Uh, you can see here, again, uh, the number of individuals that uh, we've served in the past year uh, looks very similar to the GAP program. And much like the GAP program, we're, you know, we're seeing a, a completion rate uh, you know, well in excess of 80 uh, percent, and we're satisfied with the overall employment rate of individuals coming out of the program. Next slide, please. And so now we tie it into a, a, a pilot program that three Iowa community colleges are participating in. Our Department of Human Services, which is responsible for the SNAP program, wanted us to kind of start small in this regard. But clearly, the funding that is being made available to our colleges through the GAP and, and uh, PACE programs are really attempting to accomplish the very, very same objectives that the SNAP ENT program uh, is, uh, is wanting to address. Uh, our plan is that next year we'll expand uh, the program to include additional community colleges. I know we've had more than half already expressed their interest in doing so, and we've identified one community-based organization, the Des Moines, that's uh, very interested in joining the program as well. Um, historically, uh, Kirkwood Community College piloted the Gap and Pace programs in Iowa some years ago. We went back and, and analyzed uh, the individuals that had gone through the program, and uh, what we were seeing was that about 50% of our GAP participants uh, had been on SNAP assistance. And so back to uh, Rachel's point, uh, we were clearly leaving uh, state funding on the table and, and not putting the appropriate uh, administrative mechanisms in place so that uh, we could, in fact, secure the 50-50 matching component. Uh, so with that, Brooke, I'll just uh, pass it back to you and certainly look forward to uh, responding to uh, any questions that might come forward from uh, those, of, those of you that are on the call today. Thank you. Thanks so much, Steve. Um, next, we're going to hear from David Kaz at Seattle Jobs Initiative, and he's going to be discussing uh, Washington State's basic food employment and training program. David? Yeah, thanks, Rachel, and thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, you may have heard a few things already about Washington's SNAP ENT program, which we do call BFET. And um, for those who are, you know, well along planning your SNAP ENT programs for those of you who are have no action in your state. Yet, I just want to say that Washington was able to build a robust, successful program utilizing SNAP ENT 50-50 funds. And that you already have in your state the resources. You have your community colleges, you have workforce intermediaries, you have community agencies doing employment and training for this population from which to build a successful 50-50 program. You just need to reframe your strategy, build a plan to take advantage of your current uh, assets to do so. So let's go into the presentation. Next slide, please, Yuri. So Rachel already kind of defined what a third-party match is, is what we're doing with SNAP, uh, our SNAP-ND program, BFET. So I won't really 
uh, get into that, but uh, I will provide an overview of how this looks in Washington State. We have a flexible and expansive third-party match model where service providers, the colleges and CBOs, community-based organizations, are the front gate for SNAP ENT participants, just as they are for their other students and clients. And then they have the ability to assess potential participants and refer appropriate people back into the, to the state to complete the enrollment at the SNAP ENT, and then they can provide them services and get their uh, reimbursement, or they can cross refer them to other providers' programs if those are more appropriate. Uh, so next slide, please, Ray. So this slide I included, uh, Brooke mentioned that we're talking to a lot of states, uh, NSC and Seattle Jobs Initiative, to help them get started with their SNAP ENT programs. And a lot of states uh, are not even to the point where they're ready for sort of the nuts and bolts of how you build a program, but they simply want to know how you get the process started in your state for agreeing that this is something that you should do um, and kind of planning for what a model could look like. And so I included the slide to show you uh, how Washington's BFEP program started and kind of who was at the table. And the main point here, I know it's kind of complicated uh, diagram, but perhaps the most productive way to get a third party 50-50 match program sparked is to bring together any champions you have at your state SNAP agency, and in our case it was DSHS, that's our SNAP agency, Region 4, which is King County, and bring them together with the organizations that your community colleges, your community agencies that are already making investments in employment and training for low-income populations. These are the groups that have the matching resources for a third-party match model, and they could see these resources expand by virtue of the 50% federal match to serve many more individuals. So they should be highly motivated to participate. Um, and in Washington, these groups came together to form a SNAP ENT pilot planning group, which you see there. And this group uh, worked on both the initial planning, developing a business plan or strategic plan that really outlines kind of what the SNAP ENT is going to look like, uh, what program services are going to be offered, what population is going to be targeted, who are the initial providers going to be, what are their matching sources, what are the state staffing requirements? How is that going to be provided? And then this group was also the driver to influence the state decision makers to actually move ahead. So they had a lot. They had some political clout. Um, we were able to say we have a good plan. Let's let's move forward. And it was important to have the providers in at the ground floor because we set the stage to have um, a SNAP ENT 5050 program that was a collaboration, not a directive approach from the state. So you had the experts um, in workforce who were helping to design and improve the program. We also started small in a, in a very small geography that had a lot of resources in terms of college and, and community-based organization workforce providers. But it allowed us, starting small, to work out the bugs. And there were quite a few bugs. And then once we got those resolved, we were able to grow. Next slide, please. So this shows um, how we expanded um, over nine years. We're now in 2015, and this is so this is a little bit behind. But we started out with just uh, four community-based organizations and one community college in a, in our SNAP ENT pilot. Uh, you can see the budget there, um, and we quickly grew, especially in the last few years, uh, to all 34 of the state's community technical colleges are now BFEP providers as well as more than 30 community-based organizations. We're serving about 30,000 a year, um, and we have a budget of about $30 million. And most of that is 50-50. I mean, there's a few, you know, there's some 100% money in that in that last year, the $29.6 million, but it's mostly the 50% match plus the 50% of what the local, uh, local communities are investing. So next slide, please. I won't spend too much time on, our, on outcomes, but I do want to say that it's important to keep your data for a lot of reasons. Obviously, you want to improve the program, but it's also how you support your program, both at your state and at the federal level as well. Data is becoming more important. So we have had two independent studies done, and those wouldn't have been successful without a lot of data sort of built in at the ground floor. Um, and we're getting really good results, especially for um, those that are getting vocational training. Next slide, please. So this slide here um, depicts sort of the administrative structure. In many, if not most states, I think SNAP-ENT has 
really been a matter of states using their 100% funds or a portion of those, as Rachel was mentioning, to fund sort of a few small programs here and there with no real overall strategy or a sort of a robust program. And this is what we were doing in Washington prior to BFET 10 years ago. Our state had about, I think they were investing about 150000 annually across the whole state to fund a few random services. In building a 50-50 program, the state can look at their 100% funds differently. 100% um, funds, rather than sort of piecemealing them out, you can use those to build and support an infrastructure for a more robust program where program services are being provided by colleges and workforce providers using their own non-federal funds plus the 50% reimbursement that they're getting. And with BFED, the role of our state SNAP agency, DSHS, which you can see there kind of at the middle in the goal, um, they set the overall strategic direction of the SNAP program, uh, SNAP ED program, including working with FNS, submitting the state's plan, overseeing the fiscal aspects, um, and process processing invoices submitted by providers for their reimbursement. They do outreach to and training of new providers. And then at the bottom there, DSH has the CSO, which is our community service office. Um, this is where most of the staffing at the state level is, and what they do is manage the enrollment process. So they're working with providers to enroll eligible individuals into staff ENT that are referred to them by the providers. And they're also ensuring at the point of billing that participants um, were eligible for the services, i.e. they were on SNAP for which the costs are being claimed by the providers. And then the state contracts directly with 19 community-based organizations. It's actually more now. Um, they also contract uh, for services with our state board for community and technical colleges. They could and they used to contract directly with the, the colleges, but this is sort of an, an umbrella that re reduces some of the administrative burden on the state uh, um, to work through SPCTC. So um, next slide, please. So our um, uh, BFET funds are being used by the community colleges for these purposes, um, staff to administer the program. So that's the staff that works with the state, goes back and forth, rosters to see who's eligible among their students. Um, they also use funds to support staff that work directly with BFET students, such as providing navigation services at the college. It's being used for tuition, books, fees, supplies. Um, they use it as bridge funding. It's, it's uh, primary uh, focus for these funds. So a student will come in, they don't have resources to pay for college, it will take them a while to fill out the FAFSA form. So rather than sort of losing them, they'll use, say, yes, we have funding, it's, it's BFED funding, um, we can support you through one or two quarters and while you uh, fill out your FAFSA and your federal uh, aid kicks in. They also use it for uh, college-based support services. You can see there the sources of match. Washington has very generous um, financial aid, state-funded financial aid for low-income students. So we're lucky in that way that we have a ready-made match. Even with that, colleges are challenged by sort of cobbling together uh, different funding sources, including the BFET reimbursement to fund students and make sure that they last. Sometimes they'll run out of these matching sources and, and leave some uh, SNAP ENT dollars on the table. but um, for the most part, uh, that they're able to do this very effectively. Next slide, please. So the community-based organizations are using their uh, BFET or SNAP ENT funds for these purposes, basic skills, job search, job readiness, vocational, uh, sector-based skills training, case management or career, college navigation, and, and support services. Um, a lot of participants in our BFEP program in our state are co-enrolled at both a college and a, a community-based organization. So a college will be, be providing the vocational education component, and that same student will be receiving a sort of wraparound supports or um, career and college navigation from a community-based organization. And each of those entities is able to get reimbursed for their portion of what they're providing. Um, and that's actually been shown to be the most effective, and so the state encourages partnerships between and co-enrollment between colleges and CBOs because it leads to better outcomes for uh, students and, and clients at CBOs. Um, next slide, please. I think we're done. <laughs> I'll just conclude before we kind of uh, run to um, 
the next uh, presenter um, that 5050 Stop b &T really presents a great opportunity for states to build sustainable and robust skills-based training programs for their staff populations. And that most states, well, pretty much all states already have the resources, investments for match existing. They just need to create the strategy and build the administrative structure around it and pull everything together. And that they can use their 100% funds and repurpose those to create this sort of backbone structure. Um, 50-50 programs do have the added benefit of sort of creating multiple systems that have skin in the game. So colleges, community-based organizations, state agencies, and funders are all sort of investing their own resources. And it leads to a program that should have lasting support and strong advocates and creates new opportunities for partnerships um, and networks to improve how workforce programs are delivered. So I'll stop there and see if you have any questions at the end for me. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, David. Um, as we heard from David, data is an important component of SNAP e t programs, which is a perfect segue to Rachel Zinn, the director of the Workforce Data Quality Campaign. Rachel is going to be discussing how data can be used to enhance SNAP e t programs. Rachel? Thank you so much, Brooke. So I'm just going to run really quickly through some basic information about Workforce Data Quality Campaign. Um, so next. There we go. So we are a project of National Skills Coalition, um, and we advocate for inclusive, aligned, and market-relevant education and workforce data uh, that can really be used to help human capital policies meet the challenges of a changing economy and help all, um, all workers uh, advance into their careers and into sustainable jobs. Next slide. So in addition to national skills, we work with there we go. In addition to national skills, we work with a couple of other national partners. And next, we are funded by several foundations for which we are grateful. And why don't we get into the content so we have plenty of time for questions at the end. So snappy and t programs, we started looking at this um, because, as Rachel Gregg pointed out at the, at the top of the webinar, um, this is, uh, there's a lot of increasing attention on the SNAP employment and training programs. And as states are assessing their SNAP e t program design, uh, we felt like they might want to think about how they're using data for program improvement and start to think about, as they're upgrading their programs, how to upgrade their data systems at the same time. Um, in addition, the Farm Bill requires um, the, the Nutrition Service to monitor effectiveness of state SNAP e t programs. And by August, um, the federal government uh, has some plans to publish an interim rule that's going to have performance measures and other kinds of reporting requirements. So there is some pressure coming from the federal government towards uh, enhanced accountability on the SNAP e t program. So that was, again, just a, another um, opportunity for states to focus on this. So we, uh, at, we at WDQC hired um, Barry Stern, who is a consultant. And he, we asked him to, to investigate state best practices for collecting, managing, and linking SNAP e t data. And he uh, published a paper for us in March that identifies case studies in three different topic areas that I'll be going over today. So um, uh, case studies on data collection and case management, tracking employment outcomes, as well as comprehensive data linkages. And I want to point out, just before I get into the case studies themselves, that these aren't necessarily best practices. Um, they, you know, some of these are, are kind of in the works or in progress, but they're definitely strategies that are working well for particular states that are worth considering and paying attention to. Uh, so the first set of case studies is under the heading data collection and case management. So this is all about how uh, the SNAP ENT programs actually collect the data on participants and use it in their program services. So Virginia's uh, case management system, um, they've been using it since about 2008. And they use an automated system that assists in case management and is also used to help prepare their federally required uh, quarterly reports um, for a variety of workforce programs. So when people register for SNAP benefits, the case management system automatically sends referrals of eligible individuals to SNAP e t case managers so they can follow up. Um, and that automated process has been really helpful as eligibility requirements kind of shift around and helping uh, staff understand who is eligible for what kind of services. And that system was built in-house uh, by folks at 
the at Virginia um, state government, and it was actually initially to uh, manage data on work activities conducted under the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families program, but they've expanded it uh, to incorporate SNAP and SNAP ENT and a couple of other major benefits programs. Minnesota has a similar kind of system that serves multiple programs. They actually have 17 different programs uh, under their system, uh, including a number of programs served through the WIOA American Job Centers Network. Um, and their Workforce One case management system uh, was created through a partnership with their departments of health and uh, their departments of human services and the Department of Employment and Economic Development. And a key part of being able to bring those programs together in a common system was developing uh, common definitions for different data elements. So they actually have 125 data elements um, that they have set out the definitions uh, so that it, it's con so that the um, the service information and the outcomes are comparable across programs. And in addition, uh, the Workforce One system acts as a referral to all the workforce programs with their respective eligibility requirements, kind of like Virginia, but on a larger scale. And uh, Texas has, a, a, again, somewhat a, a similar uh, system set up. So they have a common intake system that enables workforce center staff to enter registration info for customers as they come in. Um, and they can register all at once for multiple employment and training programs. Uh, and the, that system updates uh, a variety of programs over time so that uh, case managers from different programs, if people are co-enrolled, based on the permission for different the permissions for different staff members, they can log on and see the different profiles uh, and how people are mo progressing through different programs and different sets of services. So they have a comprehensive picture of how they can best serve individuals. Next slide. Tracking employment outcomes. Uh, so employment and earnings are often uh, calculated using UI wage records. It can be really difficult for especially some of um, the SNAP ENT populations to track them down, especially a long term, a long time after they have completed the SNAP ENT program to look at longer term outcomes and do the kind of program tracking um, that David was alluding to in evaluation. So using uh, unemployment insurance wage records, which all states already collect um, on a quarterly basis from employers, using those records allows programs to not have to survey or track people down over a long period of time. Um, they can just match their participant records with the UI wage records and see how people are doing in the labor market. Uh, setting up those initial data sharing agreements can be challenging, but uh, several states are doing this on a regular basis specifically for the SNAP ENT program. Um, in Washington State, for example, the SNAP ENT participant records are linked using social security numbers to the UI wage records. Um, the SNAP agency, that's the Department of social and health services automatically uh, gets the UI wage records on a regular basis from the Employment Security Department. And their case management system also allows uh, those records to be linked and spits out earnings outcomes of participants so the program can track how they're doing in placing people in jobs and what people are earning. Um, Texas in, also has a long history of matching those records. Uh, they have common performance measures across all of their workforce programs, um, and they have UI wage data included in their reporting system that allows tracking of employment, re job retention, and earnings outcomes. Next. Comprehensive data linkages. So state longitudinal data systems um, can show how programs work together to help people advance on career pathways. These longitudinal data systems have been set up in every state and started out really with um, K-12 data, but are starting to incorporate post-secondary and workforce programs and link across those programs as well. Next slide. 
So the U.S. Department of Labor and the U.S. Department of Education have awarded a lot of federal grants to help states develop their longitudinal data systems. And many states that are receiving those federal grants uh, have indicated in their proposals that SNAP ENT data would be incorporated into their workforce longitudinal data systems. Um, at this time, that's really still in progress. Um, there's a couple states that have started to do that. Um, Virginia has a, a federated state longitudinal data system, which basically means that individual programs maintain separate databases, but all of that data can be brought together and linked for, to specifically answer uh, particular research questions um, or to get particular outcomes that are required for performance reporting. Um, so through that longitudinal data system, SNAP ENT data has been added. So researchers will be able to link the SNAP ENT program and see how people are moving through not only that program, but also the state's other workforce development and educational programs, and then how they're, moved, how they're doing in the labor market, um, and whether they continue to receive benefits like SNAP ENT or TANF, or whether they are able to move effectively into self-sufficiency. Uh, Florida has a similar system. They have a state agency that combines data from a number of programs, and they're able to look at long-term outcomes for SNAP ENT participants. Um, in general, data is being used in some interesting ways, but it's largely being underutilized for SNAP ENT program improvement and for answering some of these key policy questions, especially about how SNAP ENT fits into a trajectory of, you know, kind of lifelong learning and moving into self-sufficiency in combination with other programs. Um, SNAP ENT serves a very challenging population, uh, and we really think that better information about services and long-term outcomes can help refine program design and also generate policymaker support for these kinds of programs if they are really effectively helping people advance into stable employment with decent wages. So we hope this gives states uh, a couple of ideas and things to think about as they're putting together both their program design and their accompanying data system. Great. Thanks so much, Rachel. So now we are going um, to take questions from folks who are participating. Um, we have a few minutes left for questions. Please feel free to submit questions uh, through the question system if that's something you're interested in doing. And the first question is for Rachel Gregg. Uh, Rachel, the question is, are supportive services defined only as transportation, child care, and other resources, or can that include therapy through case management? Uh, I'm so supportive services are defined as anything that is reasonable and necessary for an individual to participate in an ENT component. Um, if you go to FNS's website, um, and or really even if you just Google um, SNAP employment and training, uh, there's a toolkit on our website. At the back of that toolkit, there's a list of allowable costs. Um, it shows what you can spend the money on and what you can't spend the money on. Um, Case management is really considered more of an administrative cost um, because you, what you're paying for is probably staff time um, is my sort of best guess. Although I should also say in almost every case with an allowable cost, if it's something that's not very cut and dried, um, the answer is going to be it depends and we will look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, great. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, the next question is for Steve. Um, Juan Wilson asked whether staff assistance program provides SNAP participants with GED training. Yes, one thing I failed to mention is that one of the other programs that the uh, Iowa legislature put into place was uh, now an annual $5.5 million appropriation to support adult basic ed education and ELL instruction. Um, unfortunately, we were one of only three states uh, left in the country that, that, were, that were not making a state investment in those programs. And so the answer is yes. We're looking at a very integrated approach uh, with respect to uh, integrating the use of uh, adult basic ed uh, instruction, if in fact that's the appropriate starting point, uh, or following, uh, you know, Washington Tidemass model where we'd be delivering uh, a contextualized uh, training program uh, along with adult basic education. 
And by the way, Brooke, I just uh, also want to just extend my appreciation to uh, the National Skills Coalition, to uh, the Saddle Jobs Initiative, to FNS for the incredible technical assistance that you've afforded us in helping get our pilot started. You should all, uh, everybody on this call, you know, look to those folks uh, as a great resource. And I'd be remiss if I also didn't uh, recognize the very important role that our United Ways in Iowa have played, both from an advocacy standpoint and also a, a connecting standpoint in getting us connected to a lot of the other very important community-based organizations that are valuable partners in this program. Great. Thanks so much, Steve. Uh, the next question is for David. This question came up when you were doing your presentation, David. It's from Kathleen Nelson. And she wanted to know in regard to participant eligibility, uh, would an individual need to be enrolled in SNAP or just SNAP eligible? Can you explain um, how SNAP ENT programs go about enrolling SNAP participants? Yeah, I can try. It's very, <laughs> it's very <laughs> complicated. But, um, yeah, so if somebody comes to uh, an organization and they're already on SNAP, that uh, David? entity can. Um, David. It used to be. Hello. Yeah, this is Rachel. Will you just clarify that? I'm sorry, because we have this come up. You have to be receiving SNAP to be in SNAP ENT. Right. Yes. Just to make that to perfectly, receiving. perfectly clear. So it's not just that you're SNAP eligible. You must be enrolled in SNAP. So right. Any process yes. you're talking about has to do with getting people into SNAP and into SNAP ENT sort of simultaneously. Right, exactly. Yeah, so I mean, somebody could already be on <coughs> enrolled in SNAP, or it could be that the front door entity uh, sees that they're eligible for SNAP and they are enrolling them in SNAP as part of the process, as Rachel said, of enrolling them in SNAP ENT. So they'll come into the front door of a community college or a community-based organization SNAP provider, um, and they'll be um, on enrolled in SNAP. They will be then assessed to see uh, whether they're appropriate for the SNAP ENT program. They will then be, um, it used to be that they would be referred to the state SNAP agency and they would make sure that yes, indeed, they are eligible for the, pro the SNAP ENT program because they are on SNAP and that they would then enroll them in, in the uh, SNAP ENT program and then they would so it's a roster-based uh, process where the provider is sending a roster of names and the state is then checking against that roster within their database to make sure they are eligible and sending that list back um, to the provider and saying, yes, these people are eligible or in some cases um, certain people may not be eligible. Um, so that's kind of the process we developed. We've actually, the state recently has made it a little bit more simple because uh, the process was uh, could take some time, and the providers are trying to operate in real time. They need to know sometimes is this person um, eligible to be in the SNAP ENT program. So now, providers, some providers are choosing to, uh, because they have access to the state's EJAS database system, they can get in and enroll somebody. The state still has to check and, and ensure that yes, they are in fact eligible. So that's kind of the process. It's very, very complicated, but I can explain it offline <laughs> if need be. Great. Thanks so much, David and Rachel. Um, the next question, I think, is for Rachel Gregg. Uh, there's a question, Rachel, about how one goes about finding out which agency in their state administers funding. Sure. So um, in most cases, it's going to be uh, the agency that administers your SNAP program, which is likely in whatever your Health and Human Services Department is. Um, there are a few cases where um, that SNAP agency passes the money through to the Department of Labor or whatever your workforce agency is. But in general, I would suggest that you start um, with your, just the agency where your, um, uh, the, uh, the department where your SNAP agency is housed. Thanks, Rachel. Um, this is a question maybe for Steve or David, uh, do either of you have um, thoughts around best practices for ESL SNAP ENT participants? And I know Washington State has some partnerships with its Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs. Is that right, David? 
We do, yeah. If, uh, there was uh, on the diagram slide that I showed in terms of how we administer the the state staff agency DSHS has a um, a component of it that's called a RIA that focuses on immigrant and refugee populations and, and supporting them, including through employment and training. And they have sort of um, almost a letter of agreement between them and the part of the agency that administers uh, SNAP ENT to provide employment and training services. So they will contract out um, to community-based organizations throughout the state to provide these services. And they're more of a traditional model where they're actually matching at the state level in terms of getting 50% reimbursement. And, they're, and that part of the state agency is using those additional funds to expand the size of their contracts with these ENT providers to the ELL population so that they can serve more people. Great. Thanks so much, David. Um, the next question is for Steve. Steve, somebody asked if you could talk a bit more about the particular roles that pathway evaluators play in your program, um, specifically whether they work with programs that feed into community colleges and whether they follow up um, doing job retention or follow up with participants when the program is complete. Um, if I understand the the, uh, the question correctly, Brooke. Um, again, one of the from a from a, from a performance standpoint, um, the Iowa Department of Education has now established. Uh, kind of an education outcomes initiative that's, uh, again, being funded annually out of the Iowa Skilled Worker and Job Creation Fund uh, to have one point where we have a, a team that is collecting the data associated with uh, all of these workforce programs. And I, I know that the SNAP and t component of that will be fed into that eventually. They'll be able to do the longitudinal research that uh, uh, Rachel talked about earlier. Um, in terms of, of um, the job placement uh, and then following those placements over time, uh, that's going to be, I think right now we've sort of assumed that responsibility, the three community colleges that are delivering uh, the program. Uh, what I did mention was that Kirkwood uh, is contracting with our Department of Human Services to act as the administrative entity, at least for this initial pilot, both from a, a fiscal and a, and a programmatic standpoint. And so is, and, and again, we're just in the first year of implementing this program. so. Um, not really able to answer that question completely, but from the standpoint of our gap and pace programs, uh, community colleges uh, in working in partnership with whatever community-based organizations or other third-party partners that we're working with, uh, I think we're assuming that responsibility for that kind of follow-through uh, monitoring and tracking. Hope that answers the question. Great. Thanks so much, Steve. Um, the next question, I believe, is for Rachel Gregg. The question is, if the CBO is providing services as part of a different federally funded program, could they leverage those funds under the 50% reimbursement model? No, it has to be non-federal funding. Right. So assuming that a CBO is providing services, uh, receiving federally funded providing services using federal funds, and that's not eligible for Correct. reimbursement match, right? Correct. Yes. Great. And then I think we have time for one more question, and I am going to pick a question for Rachel Zinn. And Rachel Zinn, the question is, how do you suggest that a SNAP ENT agency go about starting a conversation to gain access for UI wage reports? Ooh, yeah, that's always <laughs> that's always the, the first step. Um, so I think the the first thing is to figure out is maybe to talk to some of the other programs that are not housed in the state workforce agency and figure out whether they are getting access to um, unemployment insurance 
data and who they're talking to. Um, because a lot of times if they've kind of cracked the code of who's the right person in the UI agency or the labor market information shop to set up those data sharing agreements, um, that it saves you kind of running around and, and just even trying to find the right contact person. So a, lot, uh, a good place to start with would perhaps be the adult education uh, folks in your state or even the career and technical education folks. Uh, because they are usually in the state education agencies, but they have some history in many states of working with the state workforce agencies to get UI rate, wage records for performance, uh, and especially adult education under the new Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act regulations. They're going to be uh, making sure to figure this out as well. So that would probably be a good place to start, and they may have some suggestions. Um, and I'm always happy to talk to folks on uh, offline and we work with people in a lot of the, the UI agencies in different states, and I'm always happy to, to make an introduction if we have a contact there. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Well, I think that is a, the end of time that we have available for today's webinar. Thanks so much to our presenters for sharing their knowledge on skills-based SNAP and C programs, and thanks to all of you who joined the webinar. Um, contact information is listed at the end slide here for any of us. I do want to note that National Skills Coalition is partnering with the Seattle Jobs Initiative to provide uh, technical assistance to select states around expanding or developing SNAP ENT programs. So please feel free to get in touch with me, Brooke, uh, if you have questions about that. And Thank you again, everybody, for participating in the webinar. We will be sending out um, a link to the webinar in the next few days to everybody who participated, so that will be available to participants, and it will also be posted on our website. Thank you very much.